the Fishing Gurus Podcast. What um, are we going to call this then, boys? Obviously, a bit different, shorter, punchy. I've got Steve Ring, a punchy podcast written down. What do you think to that one for a name? That needs more work, that does. <laughs> Easy listen. Easy listen. They're not very easy with Matt on, though, are they? Send you to sleep. <laughs> I've seen some comments on social that say they're not an easy listen. <laughs> <laughs> they normally like three, four hours long, though. We wanted to do you all some shorter, topical, punchier, little half an hour, 45 minute. Yeah, well, a lot of people say to me that our podcasts are a little bit too long. Mm. But then other people say, I'm going on a long journey, going on holiday, and I'm going to smash through the whole lot. And they yeah. love it. They can sit on the beach or whatever. Headphones on, listen to four hours of me and you. There we go. What about if we get people to comment, Tobes? Yeah, I like that, because we haven't done our job and haven't come up with a name <laughs> for this. <laughs> we'll leave it to you guys out there to figure it out. Yeah, give us some name examples in the comments below. And um, you could even do a little prize. Steve it's Ringer will donate a prize out of this little box he's got in front of him. I for... bet that's a good shout. Yeah, the best name of our new short topical podcast Yeah. Will win whatever Steve gives yeah. out of his box. Rather than a gift, he can leave a prize. What about that? Bang on. Sound. First one, I want to talk to you, Steve Ringer, about feeders for natural water fishing because we can't do method feeders, hybrid feeders, pellet feeders, and this because it won't be a punchy podcast. Um, so you are the main man in my eyes, not to blow smoke up your back end at this kind of fishing. You've done it for so long. You are number one on the world stage in this style of fishing. And I just wanted to talk to you about um, everything from your early days feeder fishing and how feeders themselves have come on from that point. Happy with that? Yep, let's go. Um, What were the earliest feeders you can remember using in your fishing? Where did it start? The earliest feeders I can remember are what I call the original. Plop them there, you can have a look. Obviously, all different sizes. They're two of the smaller ones. The original Drennan cage. Wow, I remember them. They were like a cult feeder. And like when they discontinued that particular design, everyone panicked and was bought buying them. And now, obviously, we hardly use them because feeders have evolved so much. But all my early days was either a Drennan cage or the Drennan plastic, the green one that had the camo-y. Grip mesh. Not grip mesh. They did a plastic green one, like a camo-y. A solid one. Yeah. Yes, I can remember. It was either those two feeders. Yeah, uh, I tended to use cage because I've always preferred a cage. I know some people like Mick Viles, for instance. He loves a plastic feeder, mm. but I've always felt a cage you can use in any depth, purely on the basis I can tweak my ground bait to do what I want. Mm. And I always feel like on natural waters, fish are off bottom. Fish don't live on the bottom anywhere, really. Mm. So if fish are off bottom and I'm bombing everything to the bottom in a solid plastic, say, for instance, solid plastic feeder, where's my attraction? Mm. Whereas with a cage, I can make my ground bait a little bit claggy, maybe. Still lose a bit on the way down, but I'm dragging the fish back down. So Why do you think that dragging them down works so well? What What is the actual instigator for getting fish to the bottom? I just think it's about, on natural venues, fish, I think, particularly in summer, fish are always on the move, mm-hmm. swimming around, and they're swimming around off bottom. So you've got to give them something visual, maybe some scent, something they can see and home in on. And I just feel like if all your bait, it's like, if you went to somewhere and just put loads of bait on the bottom and then just chucked a bomb over the top of it, unless the fish were on it instantly, that perhaps won't find it for like hours. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're constantly casting, creating a bit of cloud, bit of bait falling off on the surface, fish can see it, it's falling down. They might start eating it up in the water, but there's so little coming off up in the water that eventually they follow it down and then obviously you can start catching them. And your thinking behind the cage feeder and your bias towards it or your love towards using a cage feeder what sort of venues did you first realize the importance of them things ferry meadows i've been fishing since i was a kid mm. and like that, i'm going back to the days where if you went to ferry meadows a lot well if you went anywhere even my canal days if you caught four pound on the canal when i was a kid that was a red letter day mm. we, mm. we've never had it so good as we've got it now and like if, i can remember going on a club match at ferry meadows and catching 20 pound best day of my life Wow. Like five, the bream were a bit smaller then. So like five bream was like that's in six hours. Five bream was an unbelievable session, that, it, and I don't mean just for me. I mean that was like an exceptional weight. So having a cage feeder that drew in the maximum amount of fish because the fishing were hard was a massive thing even back then. Yeah, obviously the difference was back then. Distance was massively limited by 
see the design. Uh, yeah. We couldn't cast them very far. We were using 11, I don't know if you m might be before your like an 11, I think they were 11 foot, like Sigma wand. Shakespeare. Yeah. I can remember that. Yeah. I had we're, one. Yeah, yeah I had the tips. one. Yeah, used to snap the tips for fun because obviously being a kid, you're not very, and obviously it was all mono, mm -hmm. weren't using Braid back then. I don't think anyone was using Braid back then. So, like, we were chucking 25, 30 metres and thinking we were casting to the moon. Well, I'm looking at these two little dinky feeders here thinking, Ferry Meadows, we're there. Yeah, we tended to fish, to be fair, a slightly bigger version of Ferry, mm. but we didn't chuck it as often. You didn't have a great understanding. I'm going back to the days of target boards. Really? Yeah, and obviously studying your tip like a hawk as it moves <laughs> and it's a wave. And, like, in reality, when I think back, I used to fish with a target board. Every bite pulled your body mm, mm. <laughs> but obviously you spent the whole day trying to line it up with a little white line on the target board uh thinking if that moves half an inch i'm going to hit it <laughs> but, no, but, in, but in reality you didn't need it but that was the way to fish in those times i'm looking at these two feeders that you've given me to start with though and already i can see there's a lot of adaptation gone on yeah on them feeders like what have you done to them what did you used to do even in the early days to things like this how did you get an edge and make these better it, from what you could buy in a shop, say. In the early, obviously, there's a limited range of weights, so mm. we were always adding extra weight. That one there's got a little bit of extra weight to it, because like you couldn't get you can't, a company can't do every single weight. Mm. So a lot of time they weren't heavy enough to get them where we wanted to go or to be accurate. So we'd add like one, two, three strips of lead. Or alternatively, if the size was slightly wrong, we'd cut cut them down to make the size right. how we wanted it, and also change the links. The links were very long. Mm. which I always felt affected by uh, detection, and I wanted something a bit more direct. So we used to take the links off and put a, just put a loop of heavy mono on. Got you. Just so that you increase in the bolt effect, a little bit tidier. It stopped them spinning a bit on the cast. Mm. Mm. So you're always looking, even back then, lot of, long before I was involved in the world scene, you're always trying to find ways of making something better. Mm. I can see here, even this lead that you've put on this one, that's a 14 gram drennan mini cage and the lead's actually at the bottom end of it which is quite a common thing on a lot of modern day feeders now is to have the weight at the bottom but even there from years ago you've already got the weight at that bottom yeah. end of the feeder weight for we quickly realized that weight forward cast better you know i mean i know we're talking more natural waters mm -hmm. but that little tiny one i used to use at twin oaks at white acres be right. before the method feeder i was just gonna say that at twin yeah oaks. we used to fill it full of meat and we used to chuck it like every 90 seconds. But I used to have two extra strips of lead on the bottom. Mm. And with that, you could be mega accurate, which a lot of people... The two lead strips was almost a secret back then. Really? Because everyone was buying the same feeder and having problems with it spinning up on the cast or couldn't get there. By putting two extra bits of lead on, we could be really, really... You, know, you wanted to be tri trimming the grass. Every bite used to come as you were tightening up. Just keep chucking. But you needed that like quiet plop. So that was like the perfect size mm. feeder. Mm. But method wasn't allowed back then. 12 inch up length for 12 all. inch up length single cube of meat sort of hair rigged and just keep chucking so, amazing sorry like are you were you buying these out of the shop and then tinkering them yourself at home yeah basically buy them out of the shop take the link off replace it and then obviously tweak the weight sometimes cut the wire because wire is obviously quite easy to cut down mm. cut the wire down just to try and make them better stop them sometimes spinning in flight just improve improve them basically but is is that was that common like are you all doing that because you, you you were saying we is, is that something you all do or Obviously. is that something just you know uh, again like kind of the more experienced anglers so to speak are doing i say we i suppose is in me phil and my old man yeah, yeah. yeah. the ringer it's, it's a family thing yeah. but i think it's like anything the best anglers are not blowing my own trumpet i think no, people, no. people have a sixth sense some mm. the best mm. i think you've got it I fish with you loads like not everyone's got that like ability in their head to just adapt things mm, mm. you can you can chuck something and think that's all right but it can be better mm. and then you start playing around with it to make it better that's next level that though isn't it because the majority mm. of people that will go and buy kit and then just just take yeah. it for granted yeah. that it's good that it, that it'll work that's it. it's like that that little those little adaptations though they're just to me they come naturally yeah i just look at it and think well yeah this is all right but if i add this or add this it's like, let's say I'd shut that out and it's spanning the cast. After two casts, how can I stop it spinning? Yeah. And, and the reason it's spinning is because it's not heavy enough and I'm having to whack it too hard. So as soon as you add a bit more weight, it stops it spinning. Got you. So Got it's ya. just little things like that that can make 
Like a 10% difference, maybe? Where did um, the next level of feeder development and fishing come for you, Steve? Because obviously you've talked about Ferry Meadows and a 25-yard chuck was a long chuck and plopping a feeder at Twin Oaks, canals. Like, when did you start venturing further and how did your feeders and tackle evolve then? I think, obviously, people started to take notice of the fact we're adding like weight to the bottom of the feeder. So, like, the next step was what I call weight forward in design. Mm. I think it's probably fair to say, I don't know if you remember Kevin Leach. Yeah. Kevin Leach feeders for us were, like, at Ferry Meadows, for instance, uh, a few other venues, like maybe Bow Beach in the early days. They were, like, a game changer. Mm. For those that don't know, they're, like, a wire cage with a lead ring around the bottom. They were one of the first weight forward feeders we'd seen. And getting hold of them, because, obviously, he was making them himself, getting hold of them was a complete nightmare. Mm. Mm. But they sort of, I think, changed the game. Why? Because they made casting a lot easier. I've always said, and I say it now, the most important part of feeder fishing is casting. Because mm. if you can cast accurately and bit, like to the right distance, basically the rest is the rest is a little bit more straightforward. If you can't cast, the rest is irrelevant. Mm. So if mm. you can be accurate, you know what I mean? I've always said, like in the early days of Ferry Meadows, being able to fish five yards further than everyone else was a massive edge. Mm. And obviously, a, a weight forward feeder enabled you to do that. But Got because you. they weren't easy to get, then based, only a few of us had them. Um, and like, a lot of people didn't realize back then the importance of being able, in open water, being able to fish five meters further than everyone else and get your own bit of water, get your own line, feed your own sort of swim. So you're not competing with others. Yeah. Yeah. Same in any fishing, pole fishing, if you can fish yeah. a bit further. Yeah. If it's a 13 edge. meter limit and you can fish 13 and a half. Yeah. That's brilliant. Very interesting. What about um, what came in terms of feeder development after that? Like, what was next to sort of arrive and influence your fishing? Obviously, the weight, the weight forward in design. So, like, the leads are off all these feeders, but I'll clip one. That's a solid. We'll put it on a cage. We've got a feeder box in front of us yeah. here, folks. A lot of rummaging going about, if you're listening. I mean, that was, like, the next. I think that was the first commercially available sort of weight forward mm. type feed of the extra obviously with the exchange system where you can interchange the lead uh all of a sudden they were a bit of a nightmare for me because they made everyone good casters mm. really so, yeah it's, it's the same as anything you come up with something maybe not everyone's got it you don't want everyone to have it no you know and there's a feeder we'll come on to later which made casting even easier mm. and definitely took edges away from the people who were exceptional casters i'd say and have you have you got you know what sort of venues did you suddenly notice people getting better as a whole and being able to compete with you more uh, obviously f i keep going back to ferry meadows but that's where i've done a lot of open water mm. natural water fishing and like even an island say like locker and places like that all of a sudden everyone was fishing like 40 50 meters whereas before a lot of people were fishing 30 to 40 yeah yeah and like you lose you create an obviously it's brilliant product but equally you lose an advantage at the same time mm. it, you know when we've there's been numerous products over the years that i've tested that i wish we could have just binned and i'd have kept them <laughs> that, and that's <laughs> honest you know what i mean because you know you, you're bringing out a product to the mass market that you know's mm. brilliant but equally it's negating one of your own edges yeah yeah have you got any examples that spring to mind of things that we developed that you'd have liked to keep kept from yourself? a guru point of view qm1 hooks were like that was the most ridiculous game changers. Yeah. You know, Real I'd, game changers. I'd rather have if I had my way, we'd have never bought a mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously that's you have to you have to. That's part of the brand. But they've obviously been a massive success story for Guru. Yeah. But when we were testing them, this is how I've told this story probably in my original podcast, but when we were testing them, we had like it was myself and Alex Bones. Mm. We had like ten, I don't know, ten, fifteen hooks each. They were so good when I finished fishing, I was cutting them off putting them back in the box and retying them, no. which you'd never do with a hook normally. But, no, you but I only had 10, and my fish to hook to landed ratio was like 99.99%. Ridiculous. So it was just like, well, I've got to cut it off and put tight again. And that was the biggest compliment I could ever pay to that particular hook. Yeah, yeah. Amazing, amazing. Um, in terms of like these style feeders, how often do you use this exchange system? Do you use it much? I Yes, because it... It's like big natural open waters. The wind can get up any time. The wind can drop. Yeah, and yeah. Sometimes I want to be able to... I might start off and you need 30 gram to hit 50 meters. Mm. An hour and a half in, the wind's got up. It's in my face. I need 40 gram. Mm. So it's just a case twisting it. Stay on the same... I want to stay on the same feeder size. But it goes back to what I said. 
making casting easy is really important, mm. which, which is why a lot of open waters, I never understand people trying to fish with a feeling that's too light. Mm. Accuracy, hitting the distance, hitting the clip hard are vital. So like that's why the exchange system is so good. If I'm on 30 gram, wind gets up, can't reach it, twist the lead off onto 40 gram, and I'm whacking the clip hard again and make sure I'm fishing in exactly the same spot. What I'd, what I'd like to ask you is, obviously you say that all of a sudden products like the exchange come out, weight forward feeders. There's loads of different companies do different yeah. feeders that are weight forward now. When that happened and the general standard of competition that you had went up, increased, everyone's better at casting... Where did you then get your edges for feeder fishing? What sort of things did you do different to stay ahead of the game? Because results say that you definitely did. Originally, I just fished a bit further out still. Yeah. Like, say, let's take frame meadows again, as example. Instead of fishing 50, I went to 60. Mm. Uh, and obviously didn't tell anyone that I was fishing 60. You used to say you fish 50? No, I just uh, sort of bypassed it. Mm. I'd just be like, if someone asked, I'd, I'll never lie to someone. I wouldn't say I'd fish 50 if I fish 60, but equally I wouldn't tell them I'd fish 60 either. Yeah, I'd, not I'd bypass the subject and just say, oh, didn't think distance was important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that way. I suppose you could call that lying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just bending the truth a little bit. Yeah, But like, yeah. I fished a little bit further out, and then you have to start looking at other things like your ground bait, as mm. in what's it doing? How mm. can I get it to behave? How often am I going to cast? Mm. Mm. Uh, th that sort. Th there's and how long is your hook length going to be? All of a sudden, you have to look at the detail a little bit more. Mm. And you've mentioned um, you've mentioned Ireland already, and using feeders in Ireland. That was such a feeder dominated um, circuit when you started going there. What did you learn about feeders and how to get the best from them when you went to Ireland? Originally, when we went to Ireland, I just used the. Originally, we used the Kevin Leach type feeder. Yeah. But obviously, I, we were losing them because there's a lot of zebras. And then, obviously, we came out with the exchange system. So I just used them in normally, like maybe a three hole, mm. normally 40 gram. Felt like in Ireland, the fish used to come to noise a bit. So that was a really good feeder. And a lot of people were using like solid cages back then. Window feeders, which obviously we'll talk about, was just starting to come in. Uh, but for myself and Phil, when we used to go and fish world pairs, we just used to adapt our ground bait for a cage. We always want, we're both cage feeder anglers. Mm. Like we both believe the same. The fish are off bottom. So like a lot of people fish a dry ground bait with a cage in deep water. You can't really fish a dry ground bait. We'd fish what I call like a heavy, claggy ground bait. So you almost over wet it. Right. Uh, but it, so it gets a lot of weight to it. But it's like you can plug your feeder with it, know you're going to lose a bit, but equally, a lot of it's still going to get to the bottom. Mm. So we we adapted our mix to fish a cage and make it more attractive so you were pulling fish to the bottom. Can I ask what the secret mix was in Ireland? We used to use uh, G5, which is off Randonide, yeah. uh, brown crumb and dynamite frenzied hemp. Nice. They're pretty much an equal part. I, d I don't think there's miracle mixes. There's, there's not a miracle mix in Ireland where you put it in and all the fish come. Mm. It's about how you mix it. And that mix was very good for absorbing a lot of water and being able to take to the consistency we wanted without ruining it. Got you. If, if the mix had been too sticky, let's say if you'd have put turbo in it, mm. you know, turbos can be very sticky. If you overwet turbo, it's pretty much... Clag. Yeah. Do yeah it's yeah. doomed, a sticky clag. What you want is a clag that's heavy, weighty, but not not sticky, so it's not going to be stuck in your feeder. Mm. Mm. Anyone who wants to um, see a little bit more about because I remember when you said that mix, that's the mix you used when we filmed... The yeah, first ever fishing uh, gurus. Uh, airport on Locker. Yeah, there yeah. is a there is a video on um the channel of Steve in action in Ireland, feeder fishing on Locker and and he shows that ground bait and how to load it into a feeder and that so well. Um so yeah, you'll have to have a little look at that one. It's quite a while ago now, that isn't it? It doesn't seem that long, but it is yeah. a lot. I reckon it's give me two four, seconds, I'll see if I'll find it. I reckon it's four years. I think ago. it's longer. Do you reckon? Yeah. Flipping it. I reckon five. Right. You've gone grey since then. I've gone grey and bold. I know, I've gone ginger. <laughs> no, you were ginger. <laughs> um, so what? what's an amazing insight is like listening to you, it's not just about picking a feeder and all of a sudden you've got the winning method. There's so much, so many other factors that can go into it. How you load it, how you ground bait yeah, it, it's what like, you put in it. You call it giving it a nip, I think. Like, yeah. Like how you squeeze your ground bait into your feeder is massive. You've got really? to think... It's all about the way, best way I can describe. Think about what you want to achieve. Mm, mm. So, like, I might have three three casts, say, with that feeder, just using your language, nipping it in. Mm. So it's barely holding in. And then that my idea with those three is to quick release, cloud it up, and then the next two I'll wedge it in really hard. 
sometimes to an extent where it's still in. Really? Yeah, the idea being cloud, pull a few fish in. I don't want them sitting up in the air or mm -hmm. up in the water. And then I, so I nip it hard to drag them down right. and get them feeding. So like you might have three chucks soft, two chucks hard and just keep keep mixing it up. Yeah. I'm a massive believer in like big, which is why I, I love big open water fishing. Make it happen. Mm -hmm. Don't just try and think about what you're trying to achieve. A lot of people I don't think pay any thought to what they're trying to achieve presentation it's like pole fishing mm. what you're trying to achieve presentation wise think about where where are the fish going to be i sometimes look and think where would i be if i was a fish mm. and then you think about how i'm going to have to present my bait to try and catch them got you got you really interesting and what uh, this is what i think is amazing folks about talking to someone like steve about this kind of thing is you could be sat next to him in a match and he's catching more than you which would often happen i'm going to say and you wouldn't know that he's nipping it. You wouldn't know that he's slopping his ground bait up. You wouldn't know that he's squeezing it harder. Someone could have the same feeder, the same rod, line, bait, everything. But what you're doing different in your bait tub and how hard you're squeezing that feeder gives you a massive edge. Yeah, it's, it's ma and it's the same with like your loose items. Might put them in for a bit, take them out. We were talking before the show. Mm. A lot of it's about impact. If it was, this is my class, I said this to everyone. Mm. If it was as simple as just ramming your feeder full of bait, everyone would be bagging up. Yeah. And they're not, because it's not that simple. No. Because like, let's take worms, probably the most popular bait to put in a feeder. Everyone loves feeding worms for bream. But if you feed them every single chuck, unless you're on an absolute pile, it doesn't work. Mm. So I might, I might feed them for 45 minutes then take them out for half an hour. So like the idea being 45 minutes to attract some fish, maybe it works. But if you keep putting them in, mm you lose any sort of impact and it might be the swim dies. So you take them out for a bit, then hit it again. And that impact of like hitting worms again will bring fish into your swim. You do it with goo, don't you? On a hybrid yes, feeder, exactly similar the, sort of thing. Exactly the same principle. I don't believe in putting goo on every chuck. So I might start without it mm. and then have two chucks with it. Right. It's all about, it impacts massive in any, same with pole fishing, same with waggler fishing. Maybe changing something can have a huge impact. You can think there's no fish there change something and catch two in two chucks. Mm, mm. How often does changing your actual feeder have an impact? Changing your actual feeder can be massive. You know what I mean? The, the, what, what I originally always, um, and something I sort of stand by is, cage to ca uh, attract and window to catch them. You know mm. what I mean? So like originally it was a like a, what I call a solid window. Yeah. So I chuck an exchange, maybe four or five chucks, particularly like Spal Beach, this was huge. Four or five quick two-minute chucks. Balbage is very deep, for those that don't know it. Like, yeah. Ridiculously deep. 30, 40 foot in places. And everyone would say, oh, you can't use a cage. But it's the same old story. If all your bait's on the bottom, the fish can't find it. Mm -hmm. So I'd have like four chucks on that and then two chucks on the window. And often I wouldn't catch a fish chucking the cage, but I'd get two and two chucks on the window. And if you hadn't used the cage in the first place? Won't catch, won't catch on the window. It's like you'd catch two on the window and think, oh, I've sorted it now. But then you are three chucks later, you've not had another bite, so you have to put the cage back on. Bring them in, cloud yes. it up, yeah, it's bit of a trap. Cage to attract them, window to catch them. That's my that's my saying. But window feeders have changed a bit now, so I don't necessarily need to keep chopping and changing. Mm -hmm. When did you first stumble across a window feeder? Can you remember the first time you ever saw one? We first saw window feeders, I'm say we, myself and brother, in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And Phil wanted to fish with them straight away. And I used to tell him, he'd come back and be like, I fish with a window. And I thought, for Christ's sake, <laughs> why are you fishing with that? We fish with cages. This is how we fish. Because I felt like at that time, there was a few people fishing with windows. Roddy Scott, who's a very well-known yeah. Irish angler, was fishing with windows. But like, I felt like he fished differently to us. We fish very different. Everyone else tended to fish more of a particle approach. We tended to fish like a claggy, heavy ground bait. So for me, a window didn't suit necessarily how I wanted to fish. So, you know, when I was quite dismissive mm. of window feeders, didn't like them, didn't see the point in them, but I didn't really see their versatility in those early days. I'll be honest and say, got that one wrong. Really? Yeah, I think windows were far more effective than I realized. The first thing about a window is they make cast, it's like casting a bomb. Mm. So like... They make casting easy. I always felt a lot of people fished a window because they made casting easy, mm. which I think is true to a degree because the feeder is only a small part of what of catching fish. You've got to use the feeder, but then you've got to load it in the correct way. And what became apparent was there was a traditional way of loading a window feeder. Maybe have some casters with some worms mixed in in a tub. I think Bob Nubb was the first person who showed us in Ireland. He had a little tub on his side tray, casters and worms mixed together, chop worms, scoop through the 
casters and worms smear the window. Mm. But after like it became apparent that people like Roddy had already took it a bit further, so they were loading them a bit more like a traditional feeder. So mixing the bait through, just scooping, which obviously was looking back was quite common sense. But because the window feeder had been designed, it was designed with particles in mind. Mm. The idea was in Ireland, you got a lot of casters and worms into the swim, but that didn't mean you couldn't load it in a conventional manner. And I'd say now, most people who fish a window feeder probably load it conventionally, as in they just load it like they would a normal feeder, drop a bit of bait in the corner, mix it into their ground bait, just single scoop. Mm. But back then it was regarded as a window feeder, a separate tub with your casters and worms, pull the window through, drop it into your ground bait, tiny little smear, close the window. That hence the name window yeah. feeder. Got you, got you. What were the first ones you ever saw, Steve? Like, what were the first windows on the market? The first windows, as far as I can remember, were the Browning. Right. I've still got like a bag full of them Have at, you? at home, yeah, obviously. But same as any feeder, the best anglers were adapting them. Yeah. They were cutting the window out a little bit bigger. They were changed. There was, a, there was a stem running through the middle. Little metal thing. Yes. Yeah, I they, remember them. I they remember were, them. Because the stem hindered bait release, because obviously it's running through the middle of the feeder. Mm. So, like, people like Rock. Roddy would probably kill me now. Uh, they were taking the stem out and re-gluing the swivel. Got so, you. like, just to make maximum space, nothing to, to uh, heed the bait release. And they were cutting the window out a little bit. That, I saw one of their feeders one. It's like a little work of art. Yeah? They, they were putting a lot of effort into what they wanted to achieve. And, and it paid off for them. Oh, yeah, Roddy's record in Ireland, I'd say, probably second to none. Mm. You know, mm. uh, so, But... Same as anything, things get out, things get seen, and then obviously companies start doing, and like window feeder is probably one of the most popular feeders on the market now. What came, how did window feeders develop for you, like in the time you've been using them? How, you know, what changes have you seen and how have you applied them to your fishing to get a good effect? Obviously the first change I made, I was slow on the window feeder, I'll, but I'll say I was slow, but I didn't, I don't think I suffered as results i didn't mm. need window feeder for what i was doing but then it's when we started going to really deep venues that the that the cage to attract them window to catch them started coming in but what was noticeable was i couldn't i had to keep chopping and changing and then obviously we came out with the oh, if find, if pick, out, pick out one we're led on like the bit the cage window mm. and like don't we wrong there were other cage windows on the market but what i wanted when myself and Adam were talking about them, Adam Rooney, that is. Mm. I wanted a true cage, a really open one. Because yeah. that's what that suits my fishing. And I, I'd say that's the most open cage window on the market, as in nice and open window at the front, but the holes are big. Yeah. Uh, so I can still get the bait down. I can still lose a bit on the way down. I honestly believe losing maybe 10, 20% of your bait on impact or on the way down is, is a huge edge. Really? Just for, for drawing fish into your swim. It comes back to what we started the podcast on, where you used to use a cage feeder more than anything yeah. else. Same thing, same theory. You know, I mean, some people will say, oh, you can do it in reverse by using a very dry ground bait. And then obviously the dry ground bait is active, it goes up. But I don't want fish going up. Mm. If To me, the fish need to come down, not go up. Got you. So if you've got a dry ground bait, yeah, you could argue this swim over the top, but you've got a constant stream of dry particles going up. So mm. in theory, some of your fish on the bottom could then go up. So to me, the best way to do it is to have it like a heavy clag or a cloud or a slop. So you lose a little bit, but the bulk of it still ends up on the bottom and you've not got stuff constantly going back to the surface. I'm, I'm looking at this cage window and obviously that is a real pathway of development in feeder fishing. When you actually think about what you're trying to achieve in terms of good anglers yourself using a cage, the Right, weight forward design coming into play to enable people to fish further. Then the window feeder, even more aerodynamic, making casting even easier, but a little bit enclosed. And then people learning how to load a window properly to get a certain effect. And then the whole reverse where you've got the ultimate casting tool with ultimate attraction. And like from them few feeders sat in front of me there, I'm holding the one that's probably the furthest developed yeah, that, the, at the, the moment. The cage window, I'd say, probably does 60 70% of my natural water feeder fishing now. Really? Whereas the solid window couldn't mm. because I, well, the originally I was drilling holes. I should have bought some actually. I don't, I Am I right got... in thinking you won the Feeder King with a drilled out window I, when, I, I, when I you were developing some, these? I caught some fish on it that day. Mm. Uh, but again, that was a similar scenario as in, I did catch some fish on it, but also I'm a, like you went back to, 
changing a feeder can just trigger a response. So like I might chuck a rocket mm. uh, and then put the window on and then you catch two. You know, I mean, I, I used to think it was because the window went further, but I did a feature with Dan Webb when he was at Match Fishing Magazine where we went in a field and we cast 60 metres with different feeders and the window didn't go any further. I, in my head, because the window <laughs> went, the window chucks better, Yeah, it'd straighten your braid out more. So you might go another metre, two metres further, but when we went in the field, it just landed in the same spot. Did it really? Yeah, it didn't land any different at all. So it's nothing to do with that? No, it must be to do with what it gives off. Mm. Or how quick it lands. Like if you're speed fishing for roach, for instance, a window sinks quicker than any other feeder. So, which over the course of five hours, let's say it sinks, I don't know, two seconds quicker. When you add that up over like, I don't know, you might be casting 45 times a minute. That, that a can, minute? That's a quick Not cast. a minute, sorry, an hour. <laughs> <laughs> 45 times an hour. That's like all of a sudden you're getting an extra 10, 15 casts. Yeah. And that could be another 10 roach, which in a speed fishing scenario so it, that's another thing you've got to think of, if you're trying to achieve like catching quick think about how quick your feeder sinks mm, mm. you know what i mean like obviously you might want to increase the weight of it but but a window feeder sinks like noticeably quicker than any other feeder on the market because it's streamlined and also when you're winding a roach in less resistance from a window feeder so you can wind them in quicker smoother yeah it's tiny little percentages but when you add them up over five hours it might be the difference between catching Done at 220 roach and 250 roach. Mm. 250 wins, 220 maybe wins a section. Amazing. People must be listening to that thinking, flipping heck, this is what we're dealing with. Yeah, but I, I regard that as like just the norm. Good angling. Yeah, just thinking about it. Yeah. And that's why I think sometimes people don't think <clears throat> about the tiny little percentages. Like I'm catching a roach to chuck. I'm catching a roach to chuck thinking, how can I catch a bit faster? Hmm. It's just little things like that, whereas a lot of people are just happy winding one in. Mm. Whereas I think if I put a window on and the fish keep coming, it'll sink quicker, I can reel them in faster, that'll catch me another 10 compared to John Smith on the next peg. But that's, yeah, the, yeah. that's the difference, isn't it? Next the level. The, that is the next level, isn't it? For people looking to, say, develop and advance in their match fishing, that, that is it, isn't it? Mm. Absolutely. I'd say, though, you can't, and I've said this before, there's, and there's certain anglers that stand out. Like I said, you're one of them, Will Raisin's another... You can't teach what's in their heads. Mm. You, you know, what I mean, you can do things and know they're right, but you can't tell. You couldn't. You can't. You, you can't say. You just know it'll work. Mm. Mm. And the best anglers have that knack of being able to do something, even if they know it's. They don't know why they're doing it to such a degree. They just know it'll work. Get a feeling. Yeah, it's a gut. It's yeah. a natural. But you can't teach that. I don't think. I just mm. think it's a bit like any sport. Some people are. Don't know if born with it's the right word. Mm. You've just got that sixth sense. I know this is going to be right. I'm going to do it and it works. Yeah, yeah. Million percent. Um, One thing that you touched on that I think is another little thing to consider. How much does noise play a part in feeder fishing for you? Like sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing. How do you use noise and how feeders enter the water to your advantage? Noise can be massive, obviously, it, like in Ireland, we always felt it attracted fish. So like a big wide feeder, like an exchange, creates a good noise. Because let's be honest, in Ireland, the fish are, the fish are wild. Mm. They're swimming around. They're drawn in like ball and ground betting on the pole. They're drawn in by noise. So a big feeder with a wide bottom creates a bit more noise, pulls fish into the swim. Equally, somewhere that's mega shallow and, and well fished, Southfield, great example. Mm. Stealth is very much key. So you want like something that goes in quiet. A window feeder goes in quiet. Or have I bought a little tiny rocket? Yeah. Or a little tiny rocket. Yes. That sort of thing. You can almost like slap that in, I call it. Got ya. Got ya. So it goes in really quiet. So sometimes big deep water, you might want to create noise. Yeah. Sometimes a shallow water where you're only fishing for five or six bites, noise can be disaster. Mm. So you might need to sneak a feeder in. So a little tiny window, a little rocket, feather it in so it goes in really nice. So you you're always going to create a splash with a feeder, but sometimes you might want to create a big splash. Sometimes you might want to, I call it sneaking a feeder in. And is there a technique you apply to do that in terms of casting and hitting your clip? Yeah, you're feathering before it hits the clip. But again, that comes with lots of practice. Because mm. like, if you just whack the clip all the time, you get a bounce back. You can hit the clip with different velocity. So before it starts to hit the clip, I'll just check it slightly check it's the wrong word but just reduce the speed and how do you do that just, just feathering finger, your yeah. spool just catch the spool slightly minimum pressure 
and it just slows the feeder up in flight and means when it hits the clip, it hits it a little bit softer, but still keeps everything straight. Mm. But then it goes in with a, a minimal splash mm. uh, because sometimes, like I say, Southfield's a great example of a water whereby it's, it's only, what, two foot? You fish out two foot. feels like it's two foot deep. You don't get a drop, do you? No, you've got no drop on the feeder and a big splash. They, they're spooked. The pegging's tight. Mm. You know what I mean? It's, it, I love Southfield. I wouldn't, I'm not criticising it. Pegging's tight. Everyone's fishing the same lines. Stealth is key at Southfield. Yeah. Whereas yeah. on Lock Earn, sneaking a feeder in is disaster. No advantage. No, because if someone next to you is putting a big feeder in, making a bit of noise, they'll pull all your fish. Yeah, Because yeah. them roach and hybrids swimming around, they hear a, a splash, they go to investigate. It's another factor, isn't it, though? Like, even in just in this little chat already, it's like we, you could branch out into there's so many little ways of getting an edge within yeah, feeders, qu- feeder fishing, quite, feeder choice. Quite often, like when I'm bream fishing, I might start off on, like, let's say I'll start off on a big rocket, yeah, putting some bait in, and then after like 45 minutes, I've not caught. So then you have to think, well, I can't, it's not as simple again as just boshing loads of bait in and catch it in. So I might, I might want to put a little tiny feeder on. I haven't bought a little... T- oh. So I might just chuck that over the top. Little caged window. Yeah, a little caged window to try and catch it. Try and, On the basis, I've got loads of bait on the bottom now. I need to work about catching something. Mm. It, it's very rare. I can't think of anywhere where you just fish the same feeder back to back. No. It's like you just. It's like setting up five pole rigs, or let's say five is probably excessive, but three pole rigs for the same 30-metre swim. Mm. They've all got a different job. One might be for fishing through the water. One might be for like a really positive rig from the yeah. deck. And one might just be a normal rig. It's the same with feeder fishing. Yes. Different presentations. Yeah. yeah. And you can change your presentation and a, de- a swim that you thought was completely dead will suddenly be full of fish. What about baiting up, Steve? That's something that even in my time fishing... And I'm pretending that I'm really young now, and I'm probably not. But baiting up, I can remember going feeder fishing for years and years, and we never had a bait up rod or bait up feeders, or we never used to crash loads of baiting at the start. And it seems to be such a big thing now. This this specific product's designed for its feeders, rods, braid, reels. Baiting up has become a massive thing. How's that influenced your feeder fishing? Obviously, it's influenced it on two levels. Firstly. You've got like what I call, that's a medium guru exchange bait up. Mm. I, f- I might be wrong again, but I think they were one of the first like bait up feeders to come to the market. Yeah. Uh, again, weight forward in design. So you, uh, obviously exchange system. So you could have two different weight or two, three, four different weights now. Yeah, we've, yeah. We've extended the range. But the beauty of them was at the time, we could chuck them on a normal feeder rod. Yes. So if I was going Bow Beach, I'd chuck that on a normal 13 foot feeder rod. So it, like they weren't what I call excessive. Mm. You could still cast them easily enough. But then once I started fishing on the world stage, things changed as in they simply weren't big enough. Really? We needed to and be that's able- a beast of yeah. a feeder, Yeah, and obviously it? you've got rules once you go into sort of sips rules, etc. And then you're looking at stuff like that. Whereas that fits inside. Flipping egg. That's a Coke can. It's yeah. like a can of beans. But then equally, <laughs> you can't chuck that on a normal... No, you normal couldn't. rod. You're going to snap your rod. You couldn't cast that on a no. feed rod, could you? No, you, you're going to once that's loaded. Let's say some places we go, we load that with lean with a bit of joker in it. Wow, that's what we did in uh, Gentanesian. Yes, canal. We fish one lot. We had one lot, and where we boshed a load of lean with joker in to, to leave it. That was our line for for a bonus fish. Right, but once that's loaded with lean, you chuck that on a normal eleven foot feeder rod. You're either cracking off or snapping your rod. Mm. So mm. then you needed a proper bait, proper baiting up tools. Were so, you? Were you? Would you say you were quick to get on the baiting up um, era? Yeah, I'd say England as a team were probably the first who sort of started using like cart rods, mini big pits. Mm. I think we led that side of it. Don't be wrong; everyone's caught up now. Yeah. If if not, some countries maybe have gone ahead in a little bit, as in design, etc. But I'd say we were the first because I remember when we used it on Ghent Tunisian, some teams complained because we used cart rods for baiting up, and because they hadn't got an orange quiver tip on, they were saying they're not feeder rods. But oh, obviously, yeah. then the, the 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 confusion was what constitutes a feeder rod. Mm, mm. Just because it's got an orange tip, does that make it a feeder rod? Because we just said, well, we'll paint the tops of them orange. Yeah, yeah. And it's a feeder rod. And obviously, then they were just like, no, let's. They just gave up on it. Yeah. And everyone used cart rods for years. But now, obviously, we've got specialist baiting up rods like mm. the ten foot exchange, twelve foot exchange, which are purpose designed. Can I ask you a question? Obviously, this is going to seem biased, but a lot of people have asked me, you know, why, why use a 
bait up rod compared to a carp rod? What's the what is the advantage to having a specific bait up rod? Why have we as a as a company designed a bait up rod when we know people can go and buy a thirty quid carp rod? The, the reason for it was obviously I used a, a spod rod, a carp spod rod, twelve foot for years. The problem with it is it's not designed to match the rods I was using. So when I say that is it's it's a carp rod. Mm. The handle was too long. So even for me, I've got quite a long arm span. Mm. I used to crack my leg on the, every time with the handle as you cast in. So it, it could cope with the weight of the feeder brilliantly, but equally, it just it you couldn't load it properly because a carp spod rod's like four and a half pound test. Yeah, cars. yeah. So like even that loaded isn't heavy for them. No. It was all right full of lean, but you fill it full of ground bait, and you felt like you couldn't compress the rod. Got yeah. So like the two key things for me with the exchange bait at rods were first one was handle length. I wanted it to match the rods I was using. So say I'm using a 12-foot event of Steve Ringer rod, I wanted the handle to be the same length. like Because to me, the 12-foot event of Steve Ringer's got the perfect length handle, so why wouldn't my spod rod have the same length handle? Yeah. I don't want. I don't need a handle that's hitting me in the leg every time. And equally, I want the length of rods to match pretty much. So like a 12-foot, but I want, when I say match, I mean like real seat in the same position. So when I'm feeding, I know my rod's exactly the same length. Mm. Mm. Uh, and the other thing was, didn't need a four and a half pound test curve. So we reduced the test curves a little bit to make them easier to cast for everyone because compressing a four and a half pound test curve rod isn't easy. Got you. Whereas we haven't given them test, test curves, but I think like the 12 foot's like 280 gram casting weight, which is still a lot of weight. But everyone who's had a chip with mine has pretty much gone off and bought one. Really? Because they, yeah, because they, and they've got cart rods. They're like, oh, it's so much easier. So, so you, what you're saying is, uh, uh, not to, not to put this in bunny rabbit ears, but the average angler struggles to compress a really. Yeah, you're not stiff compressing it, and because the handle's so long, you know, what I mean, it wasn't so bad for me because I'm big, I've got a big. But if you're like small and you've got li little arms, like so, Frankie, yeah, like Frankie, <laughs> uh, it, the handle's in the way all the time. Yeah, you know what I mean, it's not, it's not. It's not unusable, but it's not purpose designed. It's purpose designed for for people who, like Danny Fairbrass, Danny yeah, yeah. Clark, to chuck a spod 180 meters. Got yeah. You know, and then a spod weighs more. It's more aerodynamic, and they're proper thrashing it. And sometimes I wanted to bait up at 10 meters or down the edge. A 12 foot cart rod, just in the way. Mate, I've seen people take run ups to cast them. Out. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I have. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but they take big yeah. run ups. But a lot of people have said to me. Like when we launched it, I know people say, oh, you plug in your, the rods, but we purpose designed them to solve a problem. Mm. That's the way I look at it. And a lot of people, that's why I think everyone who's had a go with mine has been impressed mm. because they can genuinely say, oh, this handle's a lot nicer. It's nice and slim in the hand. It's a better length. Mm. It doesn't feel so heavy. They're not overpowered. They're, they're purpose built for a specific job. And if you'd have tried to, to bring that to market, 15 years ago everyone would have laughed mm. but now for your serious feeder angler a baiting up a proper baiting up tool whether it's for baiting up with a 10 foot down the edge at Larford with ground bait and corn and dead maggots or boshing a load of lemon on the Ghent Tunisia a purpose baiter rod is essential mm. you got can't you. you can't rep if someone's got one next to you at, at, at the sort of high level and you haven't you're at a disadvantage mm. that's Simple. Same with obviously br using braid to empty it. Braid means it empties a lot cleaner. With mono, you've got stretch, so you're dragging your bait more. Whereas with braid, you're instantly direct. You can get a much cleaner release, so you know where your bait's landing. What edges have you learnt within baiting up, Steve? Like, you know, what do you do to get an edge? Because, you know, I can go and buy an exchange bait up rod. I can buy the feeders for doing it. I can get the braid for doing it, and I can sit next to you now. How are you getting an advantage over? I other people now everyone's got the kit you, you i'm losing advantages right here <laughs> while yeah, i'm yeah, speaking yeah. on this podcast <laughs> sorry but like wh where you release the bait in your swim I, I might be wrong again but i think i was the first person to start baiting up in the water and it happened on a venue that you will know and you've got fond memories from the rowing course at ghent yes got uh, we were we were practicing there for the world for the world champs in the early years and it was mainly bream for us of and we were catching them down the middle. And one day we were, all, we were having a lineup. We had two teams practicing for like a European event. Mm. And I was in the middle. No one had caught a fish for like 45 minutes. And I don't know if you ever just sit there and you have like a bit of a eureka moment, it's quite clear the water. And I'd already got it in my head, the fish like cloud. 
and no one was catching anything. And I was like, wonder what would happen if I just chucked my bait up out and put two in on the surface. When I say on the surface, let it hit, empty it straight away. Literally as it hits the water. Yeah, because again, that again, Rowing course was one of the few venues I always felt there was a bream on every peg. Mm. They just swam up and down. There was better areas, same as anywhere, but they swam up and down. So you need to give them something to drop for. So I put two bait ups in on the surface, chucked out, put it down 30 seconds round, mm. round again, mm. then nothing. And I was like looking down the line thinking, has anyone seen me? <laughs> so then I, I put two more in, got two more bream, and like a couple of people are now like looking. And then I put a uh, put two more in and got another one. And I remember Dean saying, are you emptying them on the surface? And I was like, no. No, <laughs> no I was like, yeah. And basically, a few of the lads started doing it. And it was like, a U it was a eureka moment. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the sad thing about that was, we then fished the European event and paralyzed it. We had first and second teams. I won individual, basically emptying everything on the surface. And then we gave it all away <laughs> and lost the Worlds. No, where did you come in the world? Uh, we got a bronze. Oh, no. Uh, but, but like... And did other teams clock yeah, what you were oh, doing? Yeah, it's impossible to hide. People aren't stupid. Yeah, You've got yeah. people like Thomas Walter walking the banks. Mm, it's, mm. He can see that you're not letting your feeder hit the bottom. But up until then, I'd never seen anyone do it. And obviously, I always look back and think, yeah, we were first and second in the practice. Mm. I won individual. I think Waco was second. Kieran Rich was third. We completely... And it was all to do with feeding... You still have to feed it right, but that feeding on the surface. I remember I drew terrible on day two, where no, everyone had blanked on day one, and after an hour, no, no one had got a fish, and I was next to Teo Lyric. Yeah, big, big, big massive, lad in yeah, it. Really pick a fight with yeah. Teo, would no. you? And we hadn't got a fish. I put two in on the surface and caught one, and like no one had caught one in like for like ten pegs, and then I, I, I gave it like half an hour. I put two more in and caught two more, and within thirty seconds, I see him up the bank setting about putting one in on the surface and that was it it was gone but wow. it's it's that fine line between do you throw did we throw that event mm. and basically maybe i don't think perhaps we realized how big an edge it was mm. but that up until then i'd never seen anyone release bait that high in the water and that from now from then it's a case of i use that quite a bit so if i was putting 10 feeders in 10 bait ups depending on the venue because you've got to take into account the depth and tow so if, if I went to Bell Beach, mm. there's no point putting 10 bait ups in on the surface in 30 foot of water because I've got no clue where they're ending up. What, because of toe or your feet are swinging back? And obviously feet are swinging back. So you have to, So sometimes at Bell Beach, I'd release them two thirds of the way down. Mm. So the way you do that is you have a couple of casts at the start to let it hit the bottom and you count them down. So say it takes 18 seconds, I'll then release at 12 seconds mm. Mm. because knowing then it's quite close to the bottom. But the advantage of releasing up in the water is you get a better spread. Got you. And also, you dra again, it's cloud dragging fish down. That's a massive thing for you, isn't it? Like, that's been the consistent thing. Talking to you on this show, that cloud and attraction and making your feeder fishing more attractive to fish swimming around off bottom, I can tell that. Yeah, because I'm a... I said it before, make it happen. Mm. Don't wait for it to happen. I always say, loads of times after matches, I, I hear myself saying, you don't, you're don't, you not going to bore them on. Mm. And you don't bore... You don't bore fish on. You have to sort. Of, you don't. Well, that's a lie because if you're on enough fish, you will catch up. Mm. But if you're only on a few, you can turn maybe an average peg into a framing peg by basically a bit of cloud, thinking about what you're doing, swapping and changing feeders, keeping busy. It's all too. You see it a lot in feeding matches. Everyone starts off with the best intentions, and then two hours in, there's only you left casting out mm. because mm. nothing's really been caught. People are losing heart and they're thinking, well, maybe I can just chuck it out and leave it. I'll chuck a hybrid or a method. And that, that for me, that's the, I'm giving this away, that's the best time. All of a sudden, I'm like, no one's doing anything. I can hit this. Well, mm, I just, mm. I just want to say, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but the live match that we did together was a good example of that because I think that started quite, to me, it seems it started quite slow and difficult for you. And I remember you saying over the commentary of like, right, I need to make something happen now. It, 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 you know, and that's where you start to change things up. And then as the match progressed to middle and end, you... Mm. you yeah, it's timing. And again, I'm, yeah. I'm waxing on. But a brilliant example of this as well was Gentanesian, which was a rock hard venue when we went there. A fish was, this is a world championships. Catching a fish was massive deep shipping canal like ridiculously deep, really steep, not many, well, didn't seem to be many fish. I think there was, but they were all up. Yeah. But And they didn't want to go down. On day two, I was dry after about two hours. As in, not got a not fish Not got a fish in the net. And you fish world championship. I don't know if you've been in that position. Yeah, yeah. But two hours in, not having a fish in your net, you're feeling fairly sick. 
<laughs> and like there isn't nothing being caught really and you're starting to think but we had a little trick and the trick was this is before window feeders really window feeders hadn't really come about then odd people were using them we were fishing with like this type of feeder mm. cage etc and then we we had some of these but like 44 gram and we taped them got yeah so they were taped all the way around and then we plugged them hard and what had happened is what we'd found in practice if you like chucked a cage for long enough a few fish would obviously start to gather above the feeder and the secret was keeping keeping your call which is really really difficult and chucking that at the right time so it got to and i, I knew and tommy tommy pickering was managed then and he did me a right favor he come to me after two hours he said any good i said no and I was, I was feeling the pressure, I'll be honest. Mm. Like, you really, because obviously we're in with a chance of gold. And he said, uh, You're making me feel it, Saturday. And now. he said to me, he's actually, he, stood, he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, Look, he said, You'll catch me one, no one better than you for this. And just mm. walked off. And as he was walking off, I thought, There's no bigger compliment. Mm. Like, he's basically saying, I'm not worried about you. Mm. You'll catch me a fish. So I sat there thinking, I really need to chuck this rocket to catch one. But if I go too early, I'm going to miss it. But there's that panic in your mind. If I, I need a fish because you mm. fish better with a fish. But anyway, it got like two and a half hours. Three hours was a time. And I let it go to three hours, five minutes. Chucked it out and caught two and two. What? A roach and a perch, yeah. First chuck yeah, on first it. Yeah, first two chucks. That's a secret weapon then, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, but if I'd have gone on two hours, wouldn't have got one. Wow. And that's like using the right feeder, right time. And timing is everything. And you've even adapted the feeder. You had to adapt it so it didn't give any. It was like chucking a bomb in. Mm. I played both fish back with the bait still in the feeder. Did you? Yeah, they're only like four four out i think one was four ounce one was six ounce but like i ended up second in my section with i think i caught a skimmer late using another little trick but like 800 grams for second in section three fish what's the other little trick i've got to ask the, the other trick was a few skimmers fed late uh and like my brother phil worked out that if you put put a feeder in with pinkies like loads of pinkies crammed in it mm. chuck two feeders out with like 45 minutes to go left it and then come and fish short for like 15 minutes when you went back out with three white pinkies on you had to fish white bait over there because mm. that's the rules you'd get a skimmer first chuck it wow. happened so many times in practice so i put my two feeders in full of pinkies left it 15 minutes chuck back over the top three pinkies eight ounce skimmer and team won gold that year. yeah and we won gold yeah and like but that was a venue where timing was everything you know if you did the pinky trick after two hours nothing it had to be done at the right time mm. you, but equally it's so hard in a world champs to sit there bite this, knowing you've got a couple of little tricks, mm. knowing you want to fish because we all fish better. When, once there's a fish in your net in a world champs, the world's a great place. Yeah, yeah. When there's no fish in your net, sitting on that box, it's very, very lonely. Mm, mm. You, and it's really hard to sit there thinking, I know I'm going to catch one, but if I go too early, <laughs> there's always that temptation <laughs> to go too early. Yeah. You know I mean, you, you'll have been to venues whereby you you know you've got something but you have to use it at the right time. And that mm. was one of them venues. Million percent, million percent. So good to hear it in a in a real intense, high profile match fishing situation like that. And, and like Tobe says, you can apply that to the same timing aspect. You can apply to a commercial match. Like yeah, yeah, you the, just recently did that live match. It's the and, same. That match was a good example because it, it's a it, Larford match late, it's cart venue. Mm. It was cold. I'll, I've always known the fish at Larford like a bit of bait. But if you put the bait in too early... You, don't catch anything. So you have to make sure you put the bait in when they want it. Mm. So it's not as simple as like, well, I'll put all that bait in. And then when they start feeding for an hour to go, they'll come on. It doesn't work like that. No. You have to put the bait in at the right time, which is what that match was sort of all about. Three and a half hours of not much dobbing about catching an effect, catching odd fish. Mm. Any fish is a bonus. And then attacking it for the last hour and a half when the fish want to feed. Got you. What... um. What do you see coming next in feeder development? I'm sat here and we've talked about all these feeders and there's everything from the earliest Drennan cages on the desk in front of me to the exchange, weight forwards, different style bait up feeders, different window feeders, rocket like where do you see it going next? Is there gonna be another window feeder? Is there gonna be another cage window? Is there gonna be another bait up revolution? What do you think now? Like To be honest. Not say I'm not going to say it's gone as far as it could go because you never know. Mm. But I think a lot of it will be variations on a theme, like someone looking at a feeder and thinking, "I can make that a little bit better." And I think that will happen because mm. that always happens. That's progression. I think the rules dictate, particularly with natural water feeder f fishing, we're governed by obviously SIPs rules, which is international rules. They limit a little bit innovation. 
Mm. They, they don't stop you tweaking something. But let's say, like, I feel like maybe baiting up feeders could be improved, make them a bit more aerodynamic, maybe change the shape. But that's impossible at the minute due to rules. Mm. So that's going to limit it on the continent where they fish, obviously, to international rules a lot. So that's probably going to hold that sort of thing back. Like, I could think of maybe you could design a feeder that to, to make it easy to look empty on the surface. Mm. But then if it doesn't comply with rules, its uses are very uh, limited. Got you. So to speak. Um, you know, so that I think maybe bait up feeders is perhaps the area whereby you think, oh, I reckon there's a bit of room maybe to redesign something, but you're very restricted. Are we going to see a Guru Rocket feeder in the future? Yes. Are we? Well, don't, well if, I, if Adam lets me. <laughs> I, I've got some really good ideas for Rocket, but obviously they're in a, they're, they are what I call variations on a theme. A rocket feeder is a mm. rocket feeder. You know what I mean? It's that's they're, they're called that for a reason. But to me, you can take the best of all the rockets okay. and put them into one. And that's what we're working on. That's what I'd like to do. All right. Um, that's a that's a teaser for you folks, isn't it? Flipping heck. Don't know if we'll have to edit that bit out. <laughs> um, final question for you. If you could only use one feeder for the rest of your life, one, I'm giving you one to use, what are you using? This is a really good question because if you'd have asked me it 10 years ago, well, probably five years ago, I'd have had a really hard choice, whereas now it'd just be a cage window. Really? Yeah, because I can do anything with it. So if I've got to fish with one feeder, mm. I can fish that in shallow water, change the weight, obviously, light, and I can still get my cloud, and I can fish it in deep water. There's nothing I can't do with a cage window, whereas other feeders are a bit more limited. Right. As in like distance, et cetera, or one type of presentation. Like I never feel like a rocket feeder is great in deep water, whereas a window is. But equally, I can use a cage window in shallow water as well. So if you said to me, you're limited to one feeder, it'd have to be the cage window. Cage window. There we go. Um, that's been a belting little chat, mate. I hope that everyone's enjoyed it. A little bit of a shorter, punchier podcast for you folks. I've learnt loads. I think it's been a a proper spiral off on feeders and you can feel like I've got into your mind a little bit about, you know, it's not just about squeezing some ground bait in and chucking it in. There's so many other surrounding factors you can do with your feeders, what you use, with your bait you put in them, how you squeeze it in, where you cast. There's so much to feeder fishing and I think you've just given everyone an amazing insight into that. So thank you very much, mate. No problem. You enjoyed it? Yeah, I just feel like maybe I've gone, I've given people a lot to think about. <laughs> so hopefully no one will listen to this. Do you want to yeah. edit this with Toby? I'll edit it after when we finish. But and no, I just feel like, obviously, maybe I've, maybe some people are going to sit there thinking, actually, I don't perhaps think about mm. what I'm trying to achieve enough. Feed, feeder fishing had that chuck it and chance it, like ref, sort of reputation for mm. years, whereas I feel like people have took it to a whole new level and it's still moving forward. Mm, totally agree. And don't forget, folks, we need a name for this show. Um, so get commenting. What we are going to give them, Steve, the winner? We're going to give them, actually, it's something you left in my feeder box the other day. The best feeder... Name's terrible for feeder fishing. <laughs> pole special. But the best feeder hook there is for natural baits, as far as I'm concerned, a pole, pack of pole specials. All right. Adam might even stretch to a trade pack, might I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll give the winner of the... Comp is that your favourite feeder hook at the moment? Yeah, and obviously everyone says to me, pole special for feeder, but it's got that extra long point, long shank, stronger than they look. I use them at Ferry Meadows for Big Bream. Yeah. I use them for speed fishing for roach. There's nothing you can't do. And I like the fact with natural baits, extra long point, it stops the bait. Well, it doesn't stop it. Nothing will stop it for good, but it reduces the chances of the bait going over the point, which is the biggest problem with baits like worms and maggots. So, yeah, for me, the pole special is the best natural water feeder hook. There you go. Paul special. Get commenting. Tell you what we'll do. We'll do um, two packs of each size of it. So 14s all the way up to 22s. Two of each size for the best name for this new shorter punchy podcast. You can't call it punchy podcast. That's mine.